Yossi Media and the American Heart Association presents Check In and Check Up for Your Health. During the month of May, we focus on stroke awareness. Stroke, defined as a brain attack, most often occurs when blood that brings oxygen to your brain stops flowing and brain cells die. When it comes to this disease, black Americans suffer disproportionately with higher death rates than any other racial group. In addition, black stroke survivors are significantly less likely to be treated for many complications, including fatigue and depression, compared with white stroke survivors. Strokes can happen to anyone, at any age. Having a stroke puts you at higher risk for a second one. That's why it's important to learn the warning signs and know your risk factors, which include high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, stress, and more. Not all the reasons are clear why black people have an increased risk of stroke, but there are things you can do to reduce your risk. Today, joining Sybil in our discussion about stroke awareness are vascular neurologist Dr. William B.J. Hicks, stroke survivor Don Turnage, and comedian Roy Wood Jr. This special edition of Check In and Check Up is brought to you by the Elevant Health Foundation. With the support of the Elevant Health Foundation, we work to address health inequities and strengthen our communities across the country. Get ready to take notes, learn more about stroke, and how to prevent it. And now, here's Sybil. Hello, and welcome to check in and check up for our health. I'm Sybil Wilkes, and uh, we are going to have a discussion today in partnership with the American Heart Association about strokes and hypertension. May is Hypertension Awareness Month. Hypertension, high blood pressure, that, those are one and the same. And about, uh, we're gonna give you some facts and some information about this. About 55% of black adults have high blood pressure. Or as I used to say in my granddaddy's day, they, they got the pressure, you got the pressure. Um, black people also have disproportionately high rates of more severe high blood pressure or HBP, and it develops earlier in life. There are some historic and some systemic factors that play a major role in these statistics that I just gave you. Among them, uh, the, the report is that there are adverse social determinants of health the conditions in which a person is born and which that person lives. The determinants include lack of access to proper health care, lack of access to healthy foods. You know, many of us live in that food desert and other societal issues. Certain medications also uh, may be less effective in controlling high blood pressure in some black people. And they may require a cocktail, if you will, of two or more drugs in order to properly uh, get the, the uh, blood pressure goal that the doctor and the patient have set together. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death and a leading cause of serious long-term disability in the United States, despite stroke being largely preventable, treatable, and beatable. Did you know that approximately each year, 800,000 people in this country suffer a stroke? Today's guest will lend information and life experience. As we talk with Dr. William B.J. Hicks, our old friend is back with us today. He is a neurologist specializing in vascular neurology and stroke survivor, Don Turnage. I'm so excited today uh, to welcome in our co-host for the day, and it is uh, none other than the award-winning comedian, Roy Wood Jr. Hello, Roy, how you doing? How are you doing? How you been? How you been? You look nice with the plant back there. You, <laughs> you, you give me something to aspire to in the background. I'm still all plain back here. I, I like I like the the sports theme though. I like what you're working with. There. It's just, that's a football sitting on the box. But thank you <laughs> for the compliment. We trying so, to do it up. We gonna get better. Okay. Okay. Well, I I'll send you a I'll send you a plant to to kind of brighten up the place. How's that? Okay. Okay. All I'll right. take that. Uh, Roy, as I like to say, is black royalty. His mother, Mrs. Joyce Wood, is an HBCU giant at and as a college administrator at Miles College. And his father, uh, oh, and I should say, Roy is also HBCU royalty as an alum. He is a rattler. He is an alum of Florida A&M. And yes, Roy's dad, Mr. Roy Wood Sr., was a radio broadcasting and journalism pioneer who covered the civil rights movement, the racism encountered by African-American soldiers in the Vietnam War, as well as other important stories that affected our lives and lives of others around the world, including the Soweto uprising. Roy Jr. has also blazed the trail in his own right as a comedian, a writer, an actor, a radio show host. And as recently as last year, he was the host of the White House Correspondents' Dinner. 
and a longtime member of the Daily Show, and just this is parenthetically, Roy, I might add, should have been the host of the show when oh, Trevor Noah yeah. retired. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. A pleasure to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful, and meaningful situation. Yes, sir. You yes, know. sir. Um, so, Roy, how are you? How are you doing? What's What's going on in your world? I ain't got no complaints. You know, I've been raising this child. You know, you talk about health. It's, it's what I, one thing I do realize now that I'm a little older, I'm raising an eight-year-old. Ooh, is he's one eight? Of, yeah, he's eight now. That boy grown. He be lying and everything. He's he <laughs> really smart. Yeah, These kids are smart. Know how to play mama against the daddy the whole nine. <laughs> so, the idea of passing down good eating habits mm -hmm. and exercise and just an active lifestyle right. is something that I'm trying to pass down to my son. You know, that's something that does not necessarily come naturally right. for me. <laughs> uh, but for him, it's something that I definitely, you know, work harder at. So, you know, walk a little bit, oatmeal a little bit, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I do what I can, you know, but. Um, I'd say, you know, all in all, I'm pretty good. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, since we're talking about this particular subject today, do you have any experience with hypertension, either with yourself or a friend or a family member? Um, on my mom's side, there's a little bit of it, you know, and, and you know, going to the whole diet thing, that's also part of why I want to make sure that my son is just aware of, you know, where the smart choices are. I, I don't right. think it's completely realistic to eat healthy 24 seven, like, a, like you training for the Olympics, right? But you have to know what the good and what the bad are and like really, you know, drilling down on that. And, yeah. you know, but no, I, for my health, it's been a little bit of, you know, pre-diabetic, mm -hmm. you know, here and there and making sure that that stays medicated and I eat properly to keep that in check. Um, and a little bit of sleep apnea, which ironically can lead to high blood pressure right. if you don't handle that properly. So, uh -huh. you know, I think when we talk about health, especially in the black community, we're talking about problems that usually compound one on top of the other on top of the other because diabetes messes with your circulation, which then messes mm -hmm. with the blood pressure as well. And if you got high right. blood pressure, any that like it's it can and be it a lot kind of, of stuff. Builds on one on the other, right? Yeah, and all, but also, you look at it from a space where, and you know, the doctor can correct me on this, where the solution to one issue usually plays positively into benefiting you in other areas, you know, of your life as right. well. So let's go to the doctor. Um, he is a very busy man and is uh, taking out time to join us today. And he is our expert. Uh, and he's joining us again. It's great to see you again, Dr. Hicks. It's uh, Dr. William B.J. Hicks, uh, vascular neurology. Dr. Hicks specializes in the conditions of cerebral vascular system, including ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. His main areas of interest include a rapid access to acute stroke rescue therapy, and clinical trials. Uh, and he's got a new gig since the last time he was here with us. He's been named the Vice President of Neurosciences at Ohio Health in Columbus. Uh, the former president of the Columbus American Heart Association and now president of their Midwest Board of Directors. Welcome back, Dr. Hicks. It's great to see you. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I t thoroughly enjoyed my time last year. And, uh, you know, this month is near and dear to my heart and brain, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, but boy, I was just hearing, uh, you know, one of my favorite comedians start doctoring. And I said, well, you know, what am, what am I here for? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could, you know, uh, maybe we could talk HBCUs, you know, like, like, like uh -huh. Behind me here, but and you versus more well, versus power, we can't, so. med, you we know, can't, undo. We, you know, fam, you and we got to be quiet for a minute. We got to, yeah, somebody, yeah. somebody try to run a scam on us. Y'all trying yeah, to clown us, but yeah, we, yeah. I ain't got that much pride right now. I'm gonna just hush, hey, hey, you know. <laughs> Morehouse had the president speaking, talking yeah, about forgiving student loans, and you know, it's been a bad couple of weeks, you know, for yeah, you know, we got scammed by our brothers in a J, J. C. Penny's jacket. That's what you need to talk about next month. <laughs> 
<laughs> how not to get scammed by a brother in a jacket that don't feel. I'm sorry, doctor. Go back. <laughs> We, we all got issues. We all have that. No worry. Uh, this this uh, is what I expect when I follow Roy Wood on, on, on X and Twitter, you know, like this right. is what I get, this level of comedy. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's great to, to hear it live. live in person, right? Yeah. He, yeah. He, he's, a, he's a very bright and funny man. So let's get right to it, doctor. Can you explain to people who may not understand and are just t today, uh, they may know the word, but what is a stroke? So stroke is a sudden thing. That's something that we really have to understand. It's a sudden attack that usually occurs when blood that's giving oxygen and nutrients into uh, your brain suddenly stops. And when it suddenly stops, brain cells suddenly die. And when that happens in a certain part of the brain, that part of the brain that gives direction to your body or to your mind to do certain actions all of a sudden stop. Hmm. So that's why the, the, the symptoms are so sudden because it's a sudden blockage of blood flow or a blood vessel can burst if it's a bleeding type of stroke. Uh, and, and both of these can be can 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 lead lasting serious uh, issues that need that need urgent emergent treatment. Wow. And there are two type of types of strokes, right? Yes. Yeah, so the most common is the non-bleeding or the ischemic stroke. That's where the blood vessels in and around our brain, there's there's a, a large swath of them. It's, it's like a big tree with branches. And when a blood vessel gets blocked with either a blood clot that came from the heart or came from another bigger blood vessel somewhere, or some people have clotting disorders where your blood can get thick for no for just random reasons mm -hmm. uh, and it can throw a blood clot high into the brain and, and cause that to suddenly block other types of these uh, ischemic or non-bleeding strokes is when they just over time narrow and harden. Mm -hmm. you, know, you hear people say hardening of the arteries mm -hmm. well, that doesn't just happen in the heart that can happen in the brain, it can happen in the kidney, it can happen all over your body. And so when th those heart, when those blood vessels start to harden, the flow doesn't get through as quickly and as expeditiously as we're used to, and, and, and it could suddenly stop the, the, the blood flow that way. So that's the ischemic or the non-bleeding stroke. Mm -hmm. That's about 85% uh, percent of all strokes. The other 15 are when a blood vessel bursts. You know, we, we, we hear the we hear the adage pressure bus pipes. Mm -hmm. Well, that, 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 that really happens. That happens in the brain where over time, if your blood pressure is high for a long period of time, it's just too much pressure on that pipe, on that particular blood vessel, and it can cause it to burst. That's the most common cause of bleeding strokes. Those are the toughest ones to treat. We don't have the treatment options for the bursting blood vessel, uh, hemorrhagic strokes or mm -hmm. the bleeding strokes like we do the the options for treatment uh, in the ischemic stroke. But we're getting better and we're working on uh, treatment options for, for the bleeding kind as well as the non-bleeding. I don't know about you, Roy, but I'm, I'm getting all kind of visuals here. Is, is uh, going into the brain, is that the only way to stop the hemorrhagic stroke or to, to, to stem the damage? That's a great question. There was a recent trial, and I don't want to bore you too much with this, but we finally found that there is a neuro, there's a way to do a very, very, what we call minimally invasive uh, type of, of brain procedure where we can find where the bleeding is. If it's close to the skull, if it's mm -hmm. not deep into the brain, they can use a technique to try to drain the blood and, and improve your outcome. Because the key is to stop the bleeding or to, and to cut it out. Some, mm -hmm. if it's a really bad bleed, Think of, you know, you know, when your mama and your grandmama say you got a hard head, you know, mm -hmm. I know mine did all the time. And it's true. Our skull doesn't move, but we got big brains. If you want the fam or you want the Morehouse or Howard or whatever, <laughs> Spellman, like my, my wife and all my female uh, relatives, uh, then, you know, you've got a big brain. And so if there's all of a sudden blood there, there's no way, there's no place for the, 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 the blood to go. It's just right. going to press on the brain and cause you... To, to have serious, serious issues. So sometimes surgery is needed to get the blood out, but that's again, only if the blood's on the outer part of the brain. If it's a deep, deep bleed, we just try to control the blood pressure 
best we can. And typically the bleeding will stop when that occurs. Um, and then we have to work on how best to make sure that the patient recovers the best they can and make sure that we're handling everything else. We're excited about a new trial that we're looking at okay. where there's a clotting factor, something that we can deliver back to the patient to cause blood flow to stop or at least to clot itself. Mm -hmm. And we're very hopeful, we're very excited that, uh, that, that we can show that if we give that sort of treatment, it's called factor uh, seven. If we give that treatment quickly, uh, we can now have something that could help the bleeding strokes because those are the ones that put us, unfortunately, in the grave or in a nursing home or, oh, wow. you know, that sort of thing. Wow. Mm -hmm. And when you say quickly, we're talking with it. So, so my aunt had my aunt had a stroke during COVID mm. and it was a situation where the issues were compounded by the health systems for poor people. This is in Mississippi, by the way. Mm -hmm. So you already know. So, you go to the doctor, you go, hey, doc, I'm feeling like this, this, and this. And she's sitting around in the waiting room for three, four hours before they realize, oh, she's having a stroke. And at that point, things that progressed so quickly for the worse for her, there was one of those situations where if they had caught it a little sooner or if the medical professional had been on their thing, or maybe if my aunt itself died, no, like there was a breakdown in the awareness where we were told as a family, oh, if we'd have caught a couple hours mm -hmm. earlier, she the mobility would have been this instead of what it ended up being until she passed years later. And, you know, she ended up with partial paralysis on one side of her body. When you So when you say closing the window, is there a specific window of time from when they stroke? So I know they're, they differ in severity, Yes. But is there like a 15 minute or a 30 minute or like, so when you say closing the gap, what is that gap kind of approximately? I appreciate that question. There's a lot to it. Um, you know, I, I, my, my heart and my, my thoughts go out to your aunt uh, in, in all seriousness, because I hear this all the time. And this was a big push for what I was trying to do with advocacy work with the American Heart, American Stroke Association and what I'm, what I've been trying to em embark on for with our uh, stroke program, where I work at, at Ohio Health, and that is really being overly emphasizing the importance of time when it comes to getting to the emergency room as soon as possible, or calling mm -hmm. 911 as soon as possible, and creating an environment in communities where we have the knowledge of EMS providers. We have knowledge of the lay public and community members who might be witnesses to a stroke. We have knowledge of emergency room physicians. We have knowledge of primary care physicians. And of course, we have a robust, dedicated stroke program of stroke neurologists like myself, stroke interventional procedure uh, uh, specialists, uh, neurosurgeons, these sorts of things to really because because it, it's a team based approach, nursing care, uh, everything, it, it, it all comes into play, uh, even down to, to who reads the, 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 the pictures of the, the brain scans, mm. uh, scans mm. and MRIs. So be, because if we don't understand that it's a multi layered approach, then there will be gaps, you might have four of those things at scale, but then one of them is is is, is missed. And then there's a critical uh, delay in diagnosis and delay in treatment. So uh, yeah. the, the, the key is really, that's why, you know, with American Heart, American Stroke Association, we really push knowing what the signs and symptoms are and right. what to look for. And then what I tell people all the time, you don't dial my office, you don't uh, kind of hit me up, uh, you know, on, on a text or, or a cell phone, you don't Google it, you don't go to chat GPT about it, you don't okay. call your neighbor, you don't call your cousin and them, you call 911. Uh, to make sure that you and, and and hopefully you are in a community where there are proper protocols. If someone's exhibiting signs and symptoms of stroke, they act fast to get them to the right place. Right. Because right. not every emergency room, not every hospital, not every stroke center is created equal. And the EMS providers typically should know that and know, OK, there's these symptoms going on. They need to go to this place. 
because they're in tuned on what this is, what this isn't. And at least if they're not sure, they can get the right uh, workup uh, uh, kind of worked up and, and kind of figured out uh, in a timely, timely uh, fashion. Because minutes matter uh, when it comes to this. There is a clot busting drug that we give through the IV for people that are having uh, the ischemic stroke, uh, mm -hmm. where clot uh, occurs or where blood flow is, is blocked. And that is very time dependent, Roy, to, to, your, to your point. But um, it's typically within three hours for certain high risk people, like older mm -hmm. people, people that have uh, that are on certain medications, people that are, are diabetic and elderly. Uh, but really, the, the majority of people, they can get that drug within four and a half hours of when they were last normal. Uh, but the magic of the medication is getting it quickly. Quickly. Everything is about time. Time. Yeah. Time is brain. Because if you get it done within, if you get that medication within an hour, there's a very high chance you're walking out of the hospital. Wow. If well, let's, let's four see. minutes, 29, you know, or four hours, 29 minutes, then wow. you, you might have a longer uh, road to hope. We are hearing from the expert, Dr. Uh, William B.J. Hicks. Let's go to someone who has survived this uh, and, and she's lived through this. Uh, please welcome Dawn Turnage. Dawn, thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Hey. Dawn mm -hmm. experienced a stroke and survived. And so when I ask, how are you, Dawn? I really mean, how mm -hmm. are you? Yes, I am doing. I am doing wonderful. Um, Dr. Hicks, I'm right here in Columbus where you are. Fantastic. Um, yes. And, and in my situation, I, I'll share my story. Your story, I, please. Yes, I was having the blurred vision, the dizziness, the confusion, but also had two jobs. I also know that I had to keep going. And I knew that um, where I was working at, that um, I had appointments set. So I was living life and knowing that I was also um, trying to get better with my health. So I was in a program to where I had the competition of a weight loss competition. So all week long, the dropping of things and the excuses that I had is what I was doing. I was like, oh, my vision is blurry, but I, I better make an eye appointment, you know? And I was ignoring all of the signs and um, exhaustion was there. And I said, oh, I better cut back on my hours. Mm. Um, but I knew that on this particular day that it occurred for me that I had um, was going to weigh in uh, in my competition. I wanted to win, right? Of course. So <laughs> I went to work. And um, I just felt so dragging. So I went to the bathroom and I chugged down a Pepsi because I couldn't have them see me drink a Pepsi and I'm about to work out, right? <laughs> and and, and then, but when I, I didn't realize that I must have, you know, passed out or something, I woke up and I was like, did I fall asleep? So wow. um, got through the workout and on my way home, I do recall being at a stoplight and the cars were blowing. So again, I uh, apparently was having another episode uh, in which I was suffering from a hysemic stroke, the, the, a mini stroke. And I got home to my, my apartment and I was sitting there and it's like, okay, I'm just gonna lay down for a minute. And then when I get up, I'll you know just get my evening started. So while laying there, I received a cell phone call and it was a FaceTime from my sister. And um, I wasn't going to answer at first. And then I said, I'm just so tired. I answered the phone and she says, well, your niece wants to speak to you. She keeps calling out your name. Um, they call me TT. And she was like, just talk to her, you know, um, just to, this is her first child at the time. And she was like, just talk to her, help me out. Cause I can't stop her from crying. <laughs> so I said, well, put her on the phone. So I was like, Hey, Naomi. And she was two, but she was very articulate. Um, and she says, TT, you're making faces at me. And so I was so that's like, the first of the signs. That's the uh, first of the fact, signs. Right. Yes. At the FP, right. Yes. She said, and she says, you know, and her two year old self, she said, you mean, you mean. Right. And so she started to cry again, oh. which got the attention then of my sister to come to the phone to see what was going on. And my sister, uh, bless the, she's a physician assistant and she saw the signs. And she kept me on the phone and had her, her husband um, contact my other sister who was here in Columbus. And they 
um, got, my sister came over and actually it was the one who she got there. And I said, oh, I'm fine. Again, excuses. I said, just take me to an urgent care. It's similar to a doctor where I, where I could hear him saying, not every place can treat you. So I said, take me to an urgent care. I said, I don't want to go to no hospital. I said, I'm not even dressed right. Like, who says that? <laughs> well, right? <laughs> so we, we go to this urgent care and... Um, my sister is texting the other one and saying she's not listening you know we're at this urgent care i don't think they can help her so they misdiagnosed me with having bell's palsy so at that time um the doctor um, comes in and says you know it was going to treat me for the bell's palsy what i need to do and another person comes in and tells the doctor um we just received a phone call and it was my sister that's the physician assistant she called in and at that point just used her you know credentials for the purpose of saving my life that what she had saw what she had was not any signs of bell's palsy she was actually the symptoms of the signs of the stroke as she told you know so at that point they rushed me to the hospital and here i did have a blood clot that had been uh, traveling and um, the doctors say um, that if I would have laid down that or did not answer that phone, that I wouldn't be able to share this story, you know, that I'm sharing today. Dr. So, Hicks, that's a story that probably is not unfamiliar to you, but for a lot of us, that, that really brings it home, doesn't it? Yeah, D Don, thank you so much for sharing that because I, I, I do, as Sybil just alluded to, that will resonate with so many more people. Uh, so the more we have survivors sharing their story, the more we can arm folks with understanding that, uh, you know, kind of what to do and not to do. I, I want to commend your, your family members that were able to see you and were insistent. Mm -hmm. I've heard so many other situations where a family member will take the lead of the, the person dealing with the stroke who... And, and let's be honest, it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. So strokes don't often hurt. So people like to explain away things that don't hurt. You're clutching your chest. You want to get somewhere very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in a car accident, you're in a trauma, something happened to your leg, you, mm -hmm. you're having trouble, you know, because of a pain, you want to get to a hospital. You want to see a doctor right now. When it comes to stroke-like symptoms, people like to explain it away. Yes. So I really appreciate that, that uh, your, your family members, they were advocates for you. And you also highlighted, you know, the, the issue with urgent care. Urgent cares are great for certain things. Urgent cares are, and, and urgent care specialists will tell you this as well. Mm -hmm. We don't handle strokes here. We should not. If, if they if they accurately diagnosed you, they would also say, hey, we, we don't deal with this. So um, they're just not, they, they don't have the tools to, uh, pr provide uh, kind of expert level and kind of time dependent care that we do uh, at, at the stroke centers uh, around Columbus and, and in around the, the United States. Yes. But, Doctor, uh, yeah. Doctor, I know that you uh, have to leave us. I know you're a busy yes. man. Can you just explain fast and then we'll let you go? I just want people to understand because uh, as I mentioned, FAST. Yeah, I would say that uh, this is is very key. It's something that we really want on the top of everybody's mind when we're thinking of stroke-like symptoms. It's easy to remember, and it's an acronym. So the F stands for face. So as Don perfectly alluded to, the fact that you know, family members noticed that her face was different. So if you ask someone to smile and one side is is up and the other side is down, uh, th that that is a stroke-like symptom. The, the A is for arm, if your arm suddenly drifts or if it's weaker than the other side, same with the leg, that is a stroke-like symptom. Um, and then S is for speech. If your speech suddenly changes, if you sound drunk and you haven't had a drink all day or all night, if you are having difficulty getting your words out, mm -hmm. it seems like it's a struggle just to get the words out like normal or if the words that you're saying make no sense. It's like a word salad jumbled up together and people aren't understanding what you're trying to say. Those are critical stroke-like symptoms. And then the T is for time. And like I mentioned before, not time to dial my office, not time to you know uh, use your phone for other things and, and, and to dial other places, you dial nine, one, and one, and then everything else uh, uh, takes care of itself. It primes the stroke team to get ready for somebody coming into the hospital. It primes the emergency room uh, team to get ready. It primes the CT scanner team to get ready. 
it primes the, the, the EMS medics to be prepared. Uh, so it really, it sharpens everyone's uh, hearts and minds on what, uh, what we could potentially do for somebody with stroke-like syndrome. When we get false alarms all the time, you know, we, we just say, oh, never mind, it's not a stroke. But we want to get in that kind of lean in to, to what is possibly going on because it's time dependent. If I feel myself in a situation like Dawn and I think that I'm dealing with a stroke, but the doctor's like, nah, it's Bell's palsy. Uh, you just ugly in the face. <laughs> How can I advocate in the moment, in the triage, for them to go, no, do whatever stroke test you need to do on me real quick as well? Or does it take just going to another place to get a second opinion? At or that? having an advocate there with you. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. I, I think Because my brother can't call. My brother a barber. They ain't going to listen to no barber <laughs> calling the hospital. And, you know, <laughs> this, is where, this is where health equity comes into play. This is where cultural competency comes mm -hmm. into play. My my uh, congresswoman, uh, Representative Joyce Beatty from oh, yeah. the Third District of Ohio, who's uh, the uh, Congressional Black uh, Caucus uh, lead uh, just went on the uh, congressional floor uh, and, and, and spoke on the need for developing DEI and continuing DEI in, in medical schools oh, yeah. to provide culturally competent physicians. Uh, a certain side of the aisle is trying to eradicate that, which is ridiculous because it is this scenario that Roy just talked about. If you ensure that future physicians and current physicians and providers are more culturally competent, then you can start to have a bit more in the, or at least understand there might be some unconscious bias and there might be, might be some uh, implicit bias that you'll have to work through in order to be a more effective clinician. That is something that we, we have to make sure continues into perpetuity. We need yeah. continued uh, education, uh, medical education to make sure that we're always checking ourselves. Even though you have a white coat, it's not a Superman cape or a Superwoman cape. So uh, th that is something that's critically important. And if you are getting that initial pushback, yes, it is where you got to advocate for mm -hmm. yourself. And if Roy, like you say, if you know, if you, 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 your relatives, a barber, and it's kind of a little quiet on this sort of stuff, well, the doctor knows. No, you need somebody with them to be an advocate and say, okay, well, how do we know that for certain? Have we gotten all the tests done? Uh, what about these tests? And this is where, this is, you know, th this is where asking critical questions to uh, providers are important. It's not being uh, standoffish and just, and you, you know, there's a way to have a communication and a discussion about it. Well, you know, we have a strong family of this in our family. Hey, I know that I might be in my 20s, 30s, 40s, but I, I've been educated that this happens. We have pre-existing conditions in our family. I have a clotting disorder like a lupus or a sickle cell anemia. Mm. These things can happen. So I just want to make sure that we don't miss anything. That sort of uh, kind of follow-up questions, concerns can kind of help prime a provider to say, oh, well, okay, well, we can order something else. It happens all the time, unfortunately. Worst case scenario, you will have to seek that second opinion. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that happens every day in this country. And we're we're working hard on the healthcare side to try to eradicate that. Dr. Hicks, I, I'm going to kick you out of this oh. <laughs> because I know that you have. I'm sorry, Don. I said I go back to work. Oh. I'm having too much fun with well, y'all. <laughs> could I just share with Dr. Hicks one thing? Sure. My sure. my niece is in um, the Made for Medicine program. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, Kendall Wither, she just did the white coat um, ceremony. Oh, the, and the I most was recent. There. Yeah, you were there, so I saw you. I just wanted to make you know thank you for uh, being involved and part of that program. She she loves it, and um, and I appreciate the opportunity to to share oh, that I did so see you. Yeah, well, Don, thank you so much. Before Sybil kicks me out, I, I I will say just for those listening, made for medicine, as Don alluded to, it, it's a uh, it's a initiative, a, a nonprofit uh, created by uh, my my very close friend Spellman's sister. Uh, Dr. Laura S. V. Bell, who is an emergency room physician uh, here in Columbus, and she has partnered with other Black physicians like myself and others to uh, identify students who are 6th, 7th, 8th grade and beyond oh. who have been any interest in uh, being, becoming a physician. And so really taking a grassroots approach to letting them know about 
what doctors do, what type of doctors there are. There are doctors that look like you, and we want to, mm. uh, you know, in, in a role like mine, I want to, I want to hire you. You know, once you become a stroke neurologist, once you become a neurosurgeon, once you become a psychiatrist, but priming them early on to say you can do this, and let's show you how. Oh, and, and so thank bravo. you for those words. Bravo. And, uh, I, yeah, I, I appreciate my time with each and every one of y'all, and um, yeah, yeah uh, bless, bless y'all. And we're gonna get that laugh for you from Roy. So when Roy comes to Columbus, we're gonna get you hooked up. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 I'll, I'll be out there in Eastern sooner or later. I know about Columbus. All right. Big fan. <laughs> big fan over here for real. Much so. respect. Thanks, thanks right. so much, Dr. Hicks. We appreciate your time. I appreciate all y'all. You be well. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So Don, I'm glad you got a chance to to mention that. And now you have yes. a, a, a rising physician in your family. That's great. Yes. Yes. Um, let's let's go back to your story where mm -hmm. you determined uh, what what your situation was with the ischemic strokes. Mm -hmm. And and can you give? Do you have an idea, or did they tell you uh, like the period of time between when your sister got you got to you and you went to uh, urgent care and then got to uh, a full uh, functioning hospital? Right. So that is definitely uh, another doctor. I mentioned that medicine, you only have that certain window in order for the ischemic stroke. And so I, that is definitely what happened with me. I was able to get to the hospital um, right quickly. So in my case, it was um, from the time that I was normal again, because with the TIA, I was going in and out. So mm -hmm. the time I was normal again, I was at the hospital with the medication within a 30 minute time. So the fast definitely is something that um, my sister, when it started with the FaceTiming, mm -hmm. um, it was a quick, quick reaction. Um, if we could possibly had even called the first 911 and, and took me from my, my apartment to the mm -hmm. hospital, it probably even have been even faster or mm -hmm. even, you know, but uh, I was still in that window and, um, and blessed to, to do so. So. Yes. So the role of family and, and those around you played a big part. It played a big part. And, and the role, because you know how um, I'm not a big FaceTime type person, but to, <laughs> you know, but to sit there and, um, you know, answer the cell phone at that moment, um, living uh, in the house, in the residence by myself, I was like, you know, I'll call her back. She don't want nothing. You know how we do mm -hmm. it. Let mm -hmm. me just take a nap. So, but I will say that it was the, it was, um, that was the angel. The uh, assistance was, of your niece. Yes, 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 yes. Definitely angel. And to this day, she goes around and she talks to her, her friends and they let her do programs here with the Heart Association. Oh, awesome. And I take her with me. Um, and there's videos out, you know, of her, of us, you know, talking about this because one thing for sure, we have to be our own advocate. Um, right. And in doing that advocacy, I have learned a lot about even our family history. I never even knew that my grandmother had a, a massive stroke, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that as part of me talking, especially in our black and brown community, we have to, we talk. Have to know, we have yeah. to talk. What we do, mm -hmm. we're used to, oh, grandma or auntie or grandma dies, you know, she, it, it'd be okay, you know, and it's an adult thing. No, we have to have those crucial conversations that to lead us up into knowing what our family history is. Because uh, it's already a challenge for those who don't or who are either adopted or not with their biological family. So. Yeah. To have the opportunity to know what your family history is and the genetics makeup um, and, and, and the lifestyle that's your environment that you're living in, it played a crucial part in some of the changes that I had to take place in my life. So check this out. Uh, we normally talk about using the holidays as an opportunity for us to talk to our families, Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and Christmas and what have you. But we have these summer holidays coming up. We just had mm -hmm. Mother's Day and we'll have the 4th of July. And, and to have these conversations like, you know, uh, I'm putting together a, a not a family Bible, but a family guide and, mm -hmm. and talk about these things because I've had this and we'd like to give people, uh, other family members, an idea of what has happened in the past and where we go from here. Right, Roy? Mm -hmm. Like with your aunt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is a good time for, for someone like you, uh, Don, to, to share with people the importance 
of of mm-hmm. having these conversations. You don't want them. You don't want to talk about wills. You don't want right. to talk about dying. You don't want to talk about, but we have to have these conversations. Yes, we do. And we have to have them early and starting with our, with uh, include the children. Yeah. Definitely include the, yeah, include them, you know, so, because there won't always be an individual um, who has a family member, like uh, Roy said, that can call the hospital, you right. know, so. Right. And especially in in our in our communities that are underserved, so we have to be connected um, to what our family history is. And I'm going to take that idea too and use that. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. It's yours. It's All yours. right, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So, Don, tell us how this has affected your life. How um, physically? Mm-hmm. Uh, when when you came out, was was there a certain amount of rehab that you had mm-hmm. to go through, and and how did this affect your spirit? Yeah, well, you know, physically, I was like because of the, I was in a hospital um, for about a week, and my speech was slurred, and I just had to. I went through probably possibly not as much um, um, therapy as I had to go to. Sometimes my memory sometimes is a little bit off, and mm-hmm. I know that what I had to do was learn that no is a full sentence <laughs> and tell people, you know, because stress stress can happen. You know, stress can actually. Um, play a factor in that. And so I had to make sure that um, was up on my doctor's appointment for about for about two years. I did go and I did choose to uh, electively um, lose weight. I had lost um, close to 150 pounds. And wow. And, you know, uh-huh. and it's not easy, you know, no, it's, not. it's not definitely not easy. So um, try and so I'm more aware. I'm more and aware you did that without that. divorce. That's that's big. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> yes, you're right. You're definitely right. <laughs> but I will say, because you brought up a good point, that was part of my divorce had been final about four years, but it still was a baggage, you know. Uh huh. So, and then that was the reason why I was working in two jobs, so because of all of that other things that was going on. So I was just trying to to do life again. So, yeah. but in doing life again, I was ignoring what my life that I needed my life in order to proceed, you know. So um, I didn't go through a lot of the um, physical therapy, thank goodness. Um, um, I left the hospital and went back to work within three weeks um, and then just made some life changes when it came to my eating habits, my blood pressure medication. Uh, I was going to ask you, did you yes. have high blood pressure? I, I did have high blood pressure, but the dosage did have to change. Um, okay. For that, and then it's hard not to eat the fried chicken, and the- <laughs> so, you know, so I had to do all of that in the moderation. Okay, so and then get so we the have to send system. Papa Roy to your house right. like he exactly. does with his eight year old. Yes, <laughs> I think. Yeah. I think part of it also, Sybil, is in having these tough conversations that they not come from a condescending place, right? Mm-hmm. And. And this is just speaking as a person who has tried to talk with his mother. My father passed when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily, it was prostate cancer, but the conversations I've attempted to have with my mother and some of my older half-siblings about our lineage and our past, I made the mistake early on of being very preachy. You need to tell me this because (laughs) I, I, I. Not realizing that even in talking about health and wills and life planning and Mm -hmm. what color you want your casket to be and all that stuff Mm -hmm. you are forcing people older than you to do something that they may have something they may have not yet ever done which is face their own mortality Mortality, and Mm -hmm. giving them and the conversation shifted for me with all of these older people in my family when it was about you can empower us me, my son, now we know what to look for, what to check for, blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah, blah. So I think it, it's like the way vegans come around at Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all gonna uh, eat that? <laughs> well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm a eat the rib and I'm gonna die then. Give it to me. Give me the rib. Right. Versus, hey, here's how you moderate that put this with that right. just think oh, about yes. other cho- like like the like the silly choice of ground turkey instead of ground beef because mm-hmm. the red meat going blah 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 so right. i think how we enter and initiate these conversations is very key as well because you know uh comedian baron vaughn says something to me that was very profound um he said that you know our generation of black people 
we're the curse breakers. Mm. We're the first ones that are aware of what is happening to us as a race. Right. We may not have all the tools, but we know what's going on. So mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out how to reverse the trajectory of our people. And we need the old heads to be on board, but you know, yeah. they're over 70, they stuck in their ways and, mm -hmm. and it's hard. Right. It is hard. It is yes. you're absolutely right. But the curse yes. breakers, that's powerful. Yeah. And then being fierce with your voice. When you go to the doctors, ask those questions. We're used to you dress up to go to the doctor. You don't sit, you, whatever they say, they're the professionals. You don't say anything. However, no, ask those questions. Be fierce with your voice. Be bold. Be bold in your personality because it's your yeah. health, you know? Yeah. And so those were some of the things, too, that, that played that crucial um, conversations that I had to have. That's powerful, Don, and that's mm -hmm. great advice as you are you're going through yeah. your rehabilitation and 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 mm -hmm. having these doctors' visits and and conversations. What other advice would you give to people as 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 a survivor? Um, to just make sure that listen give up to your or, body. Give up the give rib. Up the <laughs> right. Or, or or if you can't give it up because it's not easy in in moderation, because then your taste buds are gonna change anyway. And that's right. what happened, you know, with me. But uh in moderation, get a buddy. Get a buddy says, Hey, you know, both of you, you know, make your doctor's appointment together if you can, you know, or at least the account the accountability piece, you know, hey, did you go? Did you go, you know, what's your doctor saying, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, so that way those, when you have to have them with other people, it becomes easy. So yeah, now when they see me coming, they be like, if I got on a red jacket, because I'm, I am an AKA, they be like, oh, it must be a heart association thing. So <laughs> I was like, no, it's a life thing, you know? Oh, so, my. and just, just keep talking about it and making sure that you do your, just like you do your other routine appointments, um, do do have your appointments and one other thing be an advocate for your community because yeah. our communities um do not have you talked about it earlier the accessibility and the social determinants that is real in health and in food so um, advocacy is definitely important whether it be a uh, writing a letter to your congressperson or your um, local individual elected official officials um, be that advocate um, for your community when you can while advocating for yourself because you live in that community. Yes. One other thing I wanted to mention, Roy and Dawn, and, and talking about time and the, the importance of time getting a patient to, to, the, uh, to the right people. Um, mm -hmm. Roy, you know uh, that uh, one of the our great comedians of our time is Sinbad, and he suffered a very yes. extensive stroke, right? Um, yeah, I just saw him a couple of weeks ago in Netflix where they did a benefit right. um, yeah. show for him. So at the same, almost at the same time, in that same period, it was during the pandemic, Tom Joyner had a stroke as well. Mm -hmm. The yes. difference was time. Mm -hmm. Tom was working out at the time. He, he's a boxer. And so he was in his, his boxing ring at home. And the woman who is his rehab coach um, saw the stroke as it was happening. She immediately knew what she was looking at and got him in the car and to the hospital. Mm -hmm. With Sinbad, when they recognized what the, the, the situation was, they called the ambulance. And because of the whatever pandemic uh, conditions were going on in Los Angeles, they could not get to him. Mm -hmm. And time was just flying by. Yes. And so mm -hmm. they were not able to save him in the same way that Tom was saying. He was very lucky, yeah. obviously. In terms of comparisons of mobility post-stroke. Exactly. And, like, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, yes. uh, and you look at Sinbad and you know he's he is not the same man that he was, but you know that he, he has the force of will to mm -hmm. come back and to, to continue his career. Tom has uh, the, uh, all of the gifts of time, that time have given him in order to make this, and it's not easy at their age either to make that complete turnaround as a young woman like Dawn is able mm -hmm. to do. But just mm -hmm. think about that. And, yes, and, and time is really is so very important in all of this. Yes, yes, yes indeed. Yes, Dawn, indeed. I thank you so much for your time <laughs> here Hell today. Yes. I, and, and I, uh, you know, wish uh, complete blessings on, on the remainder of your days. And uh, good you. luck to you, your family, and your your young niece, uh, your rising position there. Oh, thank uh, you. 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, we want to thank Dr. William B.J. Hicks and also Roy Wood Jr. I uh, want to know where are you going, what are you doing, where, where, where can we promote? Oh, um, I'm wrapping up my Happy to Be Here tour, three cities left in June, Bloomington, St. Louis, Chicago. That's it, RoyWoodJr.com for ticket information. Then I'm taking the summer off. Oh, good, good. You're going to run ain't gonna around. Be no, ain't going to be no performing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Roy, will you come back again? I really enjoyed this. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Thank my you. friend. Thank you, Don. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting yeah. you, Roy. Thank you. You too. Uh -huh. I want to remind people that if you want more information on this, please go to AmericanHeart.org or America, or I'm sorry, Heart.org or Stroke.org. Org, uh, for more information. Uh, and all the good people at the American Heart Association want to thank them. Brittany Glover, Tracy Bertot, Angela Collins, Katrina McGee, and dear Arika Kaysen. And uh, with our company, Yossi Media, I want to thank Sheree White, Diana Chickadilly, Olivia Perez, Yolanda Starks-White. Thank you for joining us for check-in and check-up and be well. <laughs>